afternoon one and all present here virtually i am arun verma head of department school of law raffles university i welcome you all on behalf of entire raffles family i welcome our chief patron in school of law honorable dr justice meena vigumbar vice chancellor dr divakar goli sir all deans and heads colleagues student ladies and gentlemen today is a great day for our university as we have a well known personality and our reward speaker of this webinar professor russell sandberg from cardiff university uk graced us with his presence guidance and accepting our request for a webinar professor russell sandberg is working toward connecting young minds to strive towards success and achievement we are grateful to him for accepting our invitation and becoming a chief speaker of today's webinar let me introduce in brief our distinguished speaker to the sincere audience russell sandberg is a professor of law at cardiff university uk his research integrates the interaction between law and the humanities with particular expertise in law and religion and legal history he is the author of law and religion cambridge university press 2011 the first textbook in the field religion law and society Cambridge University Press 2014 which explores the interplay between the legal and sociological study of religion and marriage law the need for reforms Bristol University Press 2021 which provides the first accessible guide to how contemporary marriage law interacts with religion identifying pressure points and setting out proposals for reform and subverts legal history a manifesto for the future of legal education which argues that history should be at the beating heart of the law curriculum his blog and personal websites can be found now i would like to invite and hand over the session to our distinguished guest professor russell sandberg over to you sir Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for the invite, and it's a uh, pleasure uh, to be here today. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, excellent. So hopefully, in a second, can you now see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, sir. Yes, excellent, fantastic. Okay, so thank you very much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be with you again today, and to be talking about the origin. of the common law and we often see the common law as being autonomous as being natural as being universal and that's shown in the way that we talk about the law as if it's this separate thing that's always been there and always will be there in its particular form uh, but history can question this and it can subvert our understandings of the law by showing uh, that the common law has been different over time by showing that law disputing has been different over time and therefore showing that the law can be different in the future and that really is the main theme of the book um, which you just kindly mentioned my most recent book um, subversive legal history uh, which argues that history should be at the beating heart of legal education uh, in order to question in order to subvert uh, what we think we know about law and what i'm going to do this morning uh, or today rather is um it's, it's it's morning time for me i know it's afternoon time for you that, that's that's confusing me uh, what i'm going to do today is um apply this subversive questioning approach a little bit um to the question of where the common law comes from because the conventional story of the common law is that told by the 19th century uh, legal historian Frederick Maitland Frederick William Maitland and his account of the common law is so well established is so well ingrained that it's now completely taken for granted and actually is rarely told at least not in the context of uh, law schools uh, in the UK I don't know what um happens around the world but here at least we rarely actually tell 
the history of the common law because the story is so taken for granted and so what i'm going to be asking today is it time to revisit maitland's story and this is um frederick maitland as i say he's a 19th century uh, english uh, legal historian and is seen really as the founder of legal history as we practice it today uh, in, or founder of English legal history as we practice it today in that uh, he was passionate about going back to the original primary sources um, of law historically and subjecting them to the same level of analysis, the same level of rigour as we subject um, modern law, uh, current law to. And so today's um, webinar is really about retelling and questioning um, Maitland's story. And Maitland's story has been questioned in the 20th century by SFC Milson, um, arguably the leading uh, historian of English law uh, in the 20th century. And so what we're going to be seeing in today's webinar really uh, is a dialogue between uh, Maitland in the 19th century, Milson in the 20th century, and asking how is this relevant today um, to the 21st century. And Milsom's starting point in terms of where does the common law come from is encapsulated neatly in this quote from his fantastic book Historical Foundations of the Common Law in which he says the common law is the byproduct of an administrative triumph the way in which the government of England came to be centralized and specialized during the centuries after the conquest and by conquest there he's talking about the Norman conquest of 1066. So for Milsom and indeed for Maitland and the legal historians generally, the common law is something that developed, dare I say it's something that evolved uh, in the centuries following 1066. But the real key two words in the quote from Milsom are the words byproduct. And this is where Milsom um, questions um, and amends Maitland's account because Milsom argues that the common law was a byproduct. It wasn't intended. The intention in the years following the conquest was to maintain order um, because there was instability because you know, England had just been invaded. Um, and so it was a byproduct of that need to increase order, to, to keep order, that led to increased centralization of government, which led accidentally to the common law. So that's very much the Milsom um, thesis. And it's similar to the Maitland thesis in terms of timing, in terms of saying that, yeah, the, the common law is something that, evo that developed after um, the conquest. Because there's three candidates, really, um, in terms of the time in which it can be said the common law began. As I've just been saying, 1066 is seen as a pivotal date, the date of the Norman conquest. And so, you know, one possible explanation, explanation two on the slide, that the common law developed following the Norman conquest and under the Norman kings. Uh, William I, and in particular, actually, Henry I, um, where uh, a number of innovations were taken forward. Other uh, legal historians, however, say that actually the seeds were sown earlier and can be found in the Anglo-Saxon period, point one on our slide. Others, again, say actually the, the era where the common law was, was actually formed. Um, was slightly later, a century or so after the conquest, in the reign of Henry II, um, in particular, point three on the slide. And Henry II is indeed often seen as the father of the common law, um, suggesting uh, that the conception and birth, and indeed early childhood of the common law, occurred in the third period. And the account found it in uh, the work of Maitland um, and as we've just seen in the work of Milsom basically go for periods two 
and free uh, in that um, its development post the conquest, post 1066, but the really pivotal developments occurred under Henry II. And so what I'm going to be doing in this webinar is looking at these three periods. And obviously I'm covering a huge amount of ground um, in a very short period of time. So what I'm about to talk about is obviously um, a, a, a simplification, but we can pull at things in more details in the question. And indeed, um, if you want to ask questions afterwards, um, my social media information, my email address is online. Feel free um, to contact me because, as I say, we will be covering an awful lot of ground um, and an awful lot of slides very quickly over the next 30 minutes or so. So the first possible period is the Anglo-Saxon period, the period before 1066. And again, um, we start with Maitland and Maitland's account in his epic book and um, influential book, The History of English Law, written um, by Frederick Pollux, as the two Freds, um, effectively, although most of it um, was written by Maitland rather than Pollock. And in that book, it, Maitland takes the tact which English legal historians have more or less taken since, which is to see the Anglo-Saxon period as simply the prelude, uh, as simply the prologue, um, and, and to, to, to start really in 1066, because in Pollock and Maitland it says this book is concerned with Anglo-Saxon legal antiquities, and that word's interesting, isn't it? Antiquities. But only so far as they're connected with and tend to throw light upon the subsequent history of the laws of England. And this has been called the minimalist approach, in that it minimalizes the significance of the Anglo-Saxon period. Pollock and Maitland and authors who have followed um, Pollock and Maitland regard the Anglo-Saxon period as having little effect on the development of the common law, tracing that back more to the Norman and Plantagenet era. Patrick Wormald, um, his work is really, really significant here, you know, another great book, The Making of English Law. Uh, and he criticised Maitland for underpinning, uh, under, underplaying rather, uh, the importance of the Anglo-Saxon age. He wrote, Maitland was content that Anglo-Saxon law should be archaic. He deeply distrusted the motives of those who would make it relevant. So the Wormald criticism is saying that Maitland underplayed um, the role of the Anglo-Saxons. And uh, a useful um, and very good book by Ogerin, um, makes the point as well to say that actually minimalist scholarship um, underestimates the role of the Anglo-Saxons because it adopts an evolutionary approach, an evolutionary approach whereby basically the story that's being told is look how the common law developed from nothing. Um, look, you know, comparing it to sort of Darwinian evolution, um, look how law developed from the primordial soup, from the barbarous times. And the barbarous times in this story, according to the minimalist view, is the Anglo-Saxons. So that's why the Anglo-Saxons, and that's why the minimalist approach um, underplays the Anglo-Saxons. This is um, contrasted with the maximalist view taken by authors as Walmart himself, and indeed James Cameron, uh, who state that actually there's evidence of actual disputing dealing with law in the Anglo-Saxon era. And so much of what Pollock and Maitland and others attributed to the Norman period can be found earlier, can be found in the Anglo-Saxon period. Wormald in particular argued that in the Anglo-Saxon period, in the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, because the Anglo-Saxon period is a massive period of time. In fact, calling it one period is a simplification. Um, but Romwald's argument is that towards the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, in the last century before um, the conquest, where instead of there being multiple kingdoms um, in the geographical area we now call England, instead of there being multiple kingdoms, one English kingdom was beginning to emerge and did emerge in that last century, 
and according to Romer, that development of the English kingdom coming to exist um, led to, um, sowed the seeds for the common law, because he says the levers of power, the use of law by kings to ensure public order can be traced back to the late Anglo-Saxon monarchs, Canute, Edward the Confessor, Harold II, um, in trying to maintain order through law, much of the raw energy from which the common law emerged can be dated back to those who created the English system. So those are our first two views, the minimalist view, which underplays the Anglo-Saxon um, legacy, the maximalist view that says, no, it's the Anglo-Saxon period where we see the common law starting to be developed. We see the seed sown there uh, in terms of the use of law to ensure public order. Our third and final perspective is the, what might be termed the cautionary view. Again, great work here by uh, Paul Hyams, well worth reading. Uh, the book and the article um, referred to on the slide. And Hyams has argued that this recent trend by the likes of Romwald and others um, to, to maximise the significance of um, the Anglo-Saxon period, particularly that last century before the conquest, has gone a little bit too far and has overstated the case a little. So the Corsner Review says that it's probably somewhere between the minimalist and maximalist approaches. And Romwald himself has suggested that the answer of where the origins of the common law lay depends on what question you're asking. He said it depended on whether you were looking at the history of law or the history of lawyers, the history of the system or the history of law in practice. If you're looking at the first thing, if you're looking at the history of law, the history of the legal system, the history of law as debated and applied in the royal courts. If you look at the history of the legal system, then the Maitland thesis, which focuses post-conquest and emphasises the role of Henry II, is secure. If, however, you are focusing on the history of lawyers, the history of law in practice, the history of law being used to determine disputes and the principle whereby the rule of England is answerable for the behaviour of and the rights of the English subjects, then, says Romwald, the origins need to be dated further back in the Anglo-Saxon period. The first kings of the English who could reasonably be described as the founders of the English state, although we wouldn't use that term um, to describe that, to describe um, the country in that period. But those first kings of England as a united kingdom can be seen as presiding over um, the culture which led to, which sowed the seeds for the common law. And indeed, the Anglo-Saxon England was a much invaded kingdom, but it also became a much governed kingdom, and on occasion a well-governed kingdom, to quote Loin. And indeed the key word there is became, because as I've been saying, it's not really one period, the Anglo-Saxon period, it's, you know, as you can see there, it's, you know, over 500 years. Um, and England had barely become one kingdom by the end of it, if you look at it as a, as, 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 as a collective whole. So the key word there is become by the end of the Anglo-Saxon period. Uh, England had become much governed. How had this occurred? There's a whole host of ways um, in which this had occurred. There'd been a move away from the feud, from resolving disputes by violence. The feud, the blood feud, um, was basically if there was a wrong committed against me, uh, then my family would be able to um, attack um, and get revenge and get blood from my attacker and his family. Uh, an eye for an eye in uh, biblical terms. So there was a move in the Anglo-Saxon period away from that to a compensation system, but a compensation system which was still informed by the feud, 
because the idea being um, that instead of violence as revenge, compensation was paid in order to restore the peace between the two families, between the two kinship groups. Uh, and so what you get um, is basically um, disputed um, the, re the resolution of wrongs as if it's um, international relations. The idea is if there's a wrong, there, there needs to be something that maintains the peace or restores the peace between these two kinship groups. And originally in the Anglo-Saxon period, that was violence. Uh, that, that became compensation, but compensation to the um, kin. Over time, it also became a principle that for certain wrongs, the compensation was not paid to the kin, but because the wrong was so bad and disturbed the king's peace, the compensation was paid um, to the king, so-called uh, bottless crimes. And there you're starting to get the idea that um, the king, the state, if we could use that term, is interested in public order and enforcing public order. And you're starting to see something which kind of slightly looks um, like criminal law as we know it. It was also the case um, that kings passed laws, but these laws, known as dooms, um, were significantly different from legislation today. They were ad hoc, they were specific, they were rare. And indeed, um, most rules, norms, customs in Anglo-Saxon England were local customs um, rather than anything um, from above, from the king. Um, and indeed, this was shown in the courts that existed in the Anglo-Saxon period, the so-called moot courts, that's where the term moot comes from, mooting, uh, the activity that lots of law students are uh, involved in. And these moot courts were not courts of law as we would know them today, um, but were basically just local gatherings, local assemblies, which dealt with all kinds of local matters. So they, there was no separation of powers, there was no separation between judicial um, acts, between lawmaking acts and law um, administrative acts. Um, these local councils, these moots, um, dealt with all of those matters. So yes, they determined um, and, and, and tried people, but they tried people and, 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 and administered justice um, alongside all these other functions. And they weren't applying law, they were applying local custom. And that's shown by the modes of trial um, in particular, compurgation, and compurgation was a mode of trial um, whereby basically uh, the accused gathered compurgators or oath makers, local people who would swear with the defendant, with the accused, um, as to what the um, custom was, what the local custom was. So basically they would say, yes, uh, we will swear with you that that cattle was yours originally, which has been stolen by John or whatever it happens to be. So actually, yes, there was governance in the Anglo-Saxon period, but it was very, very local. These moot courts developed into the courts of the Shire, uh, which applied at the county level, the courts of the Hundred, which uh, were at a more local level, basically around a hundred um, people in them. But again, no separation of powers and not really applying anything which we could see as law. But they were simply determining disputes according to local custom. The king had his own council known as the Witan, but again, um, reference to the Witan from um, ordinary people was very, very rare. So there was really nothing like a common law, although you could argue that the seeds were sown in various different ways here. So that's the Anglo-Saxon period in a nutshell. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm speeding through this. What about the Norman period? Well, as we can see from the slide, the Norman period covers almost 100 years of history uh, and very different reigns. Um, and the two really notable reigns were William I and Henry I. And so, you know, the first question really is, 
what was the effect of the Norman conquest in 1066 in terms of what we would today call law and order? What was the importance of 1066? And you can see the Bayer tapestry there, um, that um, pictorial record of the events of 1066, which included and culminated um, in the Battle of Hastings and the last successful invasion of England uh, by William the Conqueror, as he was subsequently uh, known. Again, we start with Maitland. The account in Maitland presents 1066 as being pivotal. As he puts it, the Norman conquest was a catastrophe that determined the whole future history of English law. So for Maitland, 1066 was a really important did. However, he then goes on to say that it wasn't a simple transplant of Norman laws into England. Because arguably, as he puts it, the laws in England were already uh, more sophisticated than that found in Normandy. It also wasn't, as he puts it, merely a mixture or a compound of the two national laws of the Norman and of the English. And as he puts for it in this classic quote, you can't use the analogy of a river here. You can't use the analogy of two streams, the Norman and the English coming together. One thing can be said with some certainty, he says, the law which prevails in England in the 12th century cannot be called a mixture of the two. But yet we see a clear influence of Norman French, because if we look at the words which are used in the common law, even today, all these words, according to Maitland, come from the Norman French. So our vocabulary, the vocabulary of the common law comes from um, comes from the French. But as Maitland points out, that doesn't mean they came in 1066. It was a slower process than that. As he puts it, these French words were not immediately introduced and did not replace the Anglo-Saxon terms. Indeed, it was only a century after the conquest that the use of legal French became commonplace. So what did happen under William I? Well, the first significant development was that whereas previously the affairs of the church had been dealt with by the moot courts and by the courts which became the moots of the shire, uh, the courts of the shire and the courts of the hundred, now ecclesiastical matters were dealt with in separate ecclesiastical courts. There had been separate um, church synods beforehand. Um, to deal with looking at um, and dealing with what we would now call church law. And of course, England at this point was a Catholic country, and so the church law was the canon law coming from Rome. But now for the first time, following 1066, you have separate ecclesiastical courts, known as the courts Christian, that dealt with um, church matters. And as Milson puts it, these were the first courts in England that looked like a court of law, as we would think of them today, because these were the first courts in England that would look up rules in books, which would apply rules. And of course, the rules they were applying was the canon law um, from Rome. And indeed, these courts, Christian, dealt with a significant jurisdiction because the affairs of the church in this period uh, were not so narrowly defined as they are today. And so things like wills, um, quite a lot of what we would now call family law, um, and also um, significant parts of criminal law, like the law on defamation, was dealt with by the church courts and were dealt with by these courts, Christian applying um, Roman canon law and also local customary law uh, of the church as well, the provincial law of the church. 
Um, the Normans also introduced a new mode of trial, by trial by battle. And this made sense because what the Normans were trying to do was to maintain order. They were trying to maintain their grip on the kingdom they had just invaded. And so it made sense to have the people who were the, um, the best fighters holding the land. And this also made sense because William gave land to his followers when he invaded. That's what he gave. In return for loyalty, he gave land. And this gave birth to what's been subsequently called the feudal system. And, you know, the nature of the feudal system and how it operated in practice as opposed to how it operated um, in uh, books is a huge topic and could easily be um, the subject of a, of a lecture in its own right. But the basic um, version of feudalism and, and, and the sort of the, the, the story version of feudalism, and again, how the, you know this is going to be different to how it actually operated, is the feudal pyramid, whereby William as the king gave land to his tenants in chief. In return, they gave services to the king, usually in terms of providing military service uh, early on. The tenant in chief then did the same thing. They gave part of their land to the knights in return for services from the knight. Again, that would typically be uh, military service. The knights themselves did the same thing to their tenants in socket. They gave land to them in return um, for services, which you know, could have been agricultural services at this point. And then there were villains who also um, worked on the land but weren't given the land. So they kind of outside this feudal system. Now what's important for our purposes is that at each rung of the feudal ladder a court developed in an organic pragmatic way because when there was a dispute between knights or between a knight and a third party that dispute would go to the tenant in chief. So in addition to giving the knight land and in return for the knight service, the tenant in chief basically provided justice for them, resolved disputes. And this existed alongside the local courts, but over time superseded it, over time it replaced it. So what you have is this system of feudal justice, feudal courts, you could say. Uh, but again, you know, it, it, it's important not to be thinking in, in terms of modern day courts when you use that term. But this didn't lead to a common law. If anything, it led to the opposite because it dispersed justice in the same way as the Anglo-Saxon court system of the um, hundreds and the shires led to local courts applying local customs and no such thing as an overall common law. The feudal courts led to separate and different laws being applied in different part, place, places of the country and also meant that there was no idea, no overall concept of the king providing justice for all of his subjects. Because the only people who went to the king for justice were the tenants in chief. If there was a dispute between tenants in chief or between the tenants in chief and a third party, that dispute would go to the crown, that dispute would go to the king and the king's council. Disputes between the knights wouldn't go there, they would go to the tenants in chief, etc, etc, etc. So feudalism actually dispersed loyalties. In 1086, uh, an important event occurred on Salisbury Plain and the Doomsday Book was presented to William the Conqueror. And this has been described as a second conquest because the Doomsday Book recorded in minute detail who owned what throughout the realm. And so this record, this Doomsday Book was presented um, to William on Salisbury Payne. But what was also important about that day 
was the three men gathered there also took what was known as the Sarum Oath, what was known as the Salisbury Oath. They swore allegiance to the king. So now for the first time explicitly they're owing loyalty not just to their feudal lord but to the king. But as Thomas Watkin has put it, this was a one-sided bargain because the king didn't promise anything in return. He didn't promise justice in return. Yet that is what would happen over the next century or so. Over the next century or so, um, what would happen was that the second part of the bargain um, would be given in that over the next century the common law would develop whereby the king would provide justice for all the people royal justice would be provided for everyone rather than just um, everyone having the justice given by their immediate feudal lord and so that brings us to our third period but before we get to our third period it's important to note a number of the developments under william I were furthered under henry I in terms of um, sending out um, justices around the country that happened under Henry I. But then things broke down in the, towards the end of the Norman reign, during what's called the anarchy. And the centralization, the, need, the ways in which the Normans had maintained order broke down. And so then the first Plantagenet king, Henry II, had the same job really as William I did, in that his first job was to maintain order. He was taken over the kingdom at a time of civil war, at a time of civil strife. And so his main priority was to maintain order, like William I. And like William I, he did that through centralization. But Henry II was more explicit in his use of law to do so. And so he's seen as the father of the common law because in his reign, in the reign of Henry II, you see the use of law to maintain order and you see the common law develop it. Although a lot of the things he was doing, uh, a lot of the innovations which occurred under Henry II were experiments um, and so uh, were done in a very pragmatic way rather than in a a prescriptive way rather than one might say an intended way but also a lot of the so-called innovations under Henry II was simply restoring um, what what was already there under Henry I the pre-anarchy um, period and so as Maitland put it what is notable under Henry II is what was previously exceptional becomes normal and again, we get to Maitland because Maitland's account emphasizes the role of Henry II as the founder of the common law. Indeed, James Cameron argues that the presentation of Henry II as the founder of the common law is Maitland's chief impact upon the teachers of history generally, not legal history, but history generally. And as we've been saying, actually, one of Henry II's first actions was like William I, was to issue a charter of liberties that confirmed the law and customs of who he saw as the last rightful king. And whereas um, William I um, said that he was restoring the kingdom, uh, the, the, the rights and freedoms of um, Edward the Confessor, so not the king which he'd immediately taken over from, but the last rightful king in his, uh, in his view. Henry II was based, said that he was um, confirming the laws and customs of his grandfather, Henry I. And as I've just been saying, many of Henry II's innovations built upon those of his grandfather and what was previously exceptional now became normal. What happened? Well, there were basically two main developments under Henry II. The first was the centralization of the King's Court. The King's Court now became fixed at Westminster and over time became a court that was open to anyone who had a writ. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So the writ system opened up royal justice to anyone um, who had a writ 
who could go to the king's court at Westminster. But in addition to that, royal, court, royal justice went around the country. The wandering judges dealt with what we would now call civil law. The assizes were set up to deal with what we would now call criminal law. These existed alongside the feudal courts, but they gave people an appetite for and an expectation of royal justice. And they led to law increasingly being commonly applied throughout the realm. In other words, a common law. And this is Maitland's point. Uh, the Maitland law became common to the whole land as local variations were gradually suppressed. As he puts it, the king's own court became ever more and more a court of first instance for all men and for all causes. But he stresses that it's important to note this was a piecemeal process and there was still no general principle that the king's, king's court was there to provide a remedy for every wrong. Yet, a decisive step in this direction was made by the development of the writ system in Henry's reign. What was the writ system? It's a picture of a writ. And basically, the writ system um, was the way in which people had access to the King's Court at Westminster. People up and down the country, if they didn't live in Westminster, had no right to be tried at Westminster, had no right to have their wrongs and their cases determined by the King's Court. And so they had to obtain special permission. And they achieved that permission in the form of a royal writ. They went to the Chancellor, and if the Chancellor gave them a writ, then that writ meant that they could then take their dispute to the King's Court. These writs provided what Milsom has called the ticket of entry to royal justice. It allowed litigants to go to the royal court. And it worked along the lines of, if you could make, if, the, your, if your dispute, if your case, if your argument, if your facts, fitted what was laid out in a particular writ, then you could use that writ to seek royal justice. So what developed was an army of different writs covering different scenarios, saying if X has happened, you will be entitled to Y. And if you could prove that X has happened to you, then you could get that writ from the Chancellor, and then you could have your dispute determined in the King's Court at Westminster. And you could have royal justice. As Maitland put it, Henry II had placed royal justice at the disposal of anyone who could bring their case within a certain formula. And Maitland's account, as we've seen in the quote a minute ago, sees the writ system as superseding as replacing the feudal courts and as leading to a situation where the royal courts, the king's courts, become the courts of common law and become the default. And Maitland makes this argument in a series of lectures called the forms of action. And the forms of action is another word really, another term really, uh, for the writ system. Uh, and in those lectures on the forms of action which were published after his death, Maitland makes, looks at how the, the writ system um, was developed over time. A century later, Milsom uh, and his work, looking back at the writs in greater detail, looking back at the primary materials in greater detail, um, starts to criticise Maitland's account and he criticizes Maitland's account for not paying sufficient attention to feudalism because for Milsom feudalism was remained more important in this period than Maitland suggested. He agrees that over time the king's court, the common law, um, would become more important than the feudal courts but Milsom argues that it occurred later on. 
And there's four main points, really, um, to Milsom's critique. He says Maitland misunderstood the role of the local feudal courts. He says this is a slightly unfair criticism because no one uncovered the role of the local court more than Maitland had done. But Maitland still fundamentally misunderstood because Maitland thought they were doing the same type of thing as the king's courts and therefore were in a competition which the king's courts ultimately won. Milsom, by contrast, says the relationship was actually one of supervision or enforcement. The rich system actually helped to make the feudal system function. A lot of the writs, particularly the early writs, were uh, directed to feudal lords to make them do right, to make them do justice to the people involved. So in many ways, the writ system, at least at first, um, functioned to make feudalism work. It didn't, it wasn't a rival to feudalism, according to Milsom, it was a supplement, at least at first. Milsom also says that Maitland's account presented the development of the rich system as being part of an intentional move towards the centralization of justice, whereas in reality, according to Milsom, it was a mere accident. Milsom puts forward evidence um, that um, Henry II and his advisors were operating into and subscribed to a feudal world um, and says that, you know, there was no intention on their part to create a common law. There was no intention on their part to undermine feudal justice. Uh, it was an accident. And Milsom points out that Maitland's account was influenced by the benefit of hindsight. Maitland knew that the common law courts would rise and the feudal jurisdictions would decrease. And indeed, Maitland's work on later periods, uh, in particular his work on Bracton's notebook, um, meant that he read that back, he read that back further uh, to, in time than when it actually happened. So the maitland milsom debate then is at heart an argument about timings, because neither disagree about the overall trajectory, they disagree about where it occurred, and about intentions. And it's now Milsom's account, which Milsom um, described as heresies, that have become accepted. That said, there are criticisms that have been made of Milsom's account in terms of his vagueness, in terms of whether he underplayed the extent to which English society was already beginning to move beyond feudalism and also whether he overplayed the extent to his Henry II and his advisors endorsed feudalism. But nevertheless, Milsom's work by large has been accepted, but he was not the heretic that he thought he was, because his work has now been seen as a refinement rather than a rejection of Maitland's account. And the work of Ralph Turner has concluded that the development of the early common law, the early land law, should be understood as being both feudalist and royalist. He says that the royalist account found in the work of Maitland, which emphasises the rich system, is part of the story, but it needs to be understood alongside the feudalist account, which stresses the feudal system and is found in the work of Milsom. And indeed, talk of a rise of a rich system and the decline of feudalism is a simplification. What occurred was not a straightforward linear story of progression. Yet that is what we're often told. And that's what we're often told about the whole development of the common law. And what I've tried to do in this webinar today is to show that the common law developed in ebbs and flows. In, in a pragmatic way, often two steps forward, one step back. It's not a linear story of progression. It's not a story of that's intended or planned. It's a story that is accidental, which is pragmatic, which is ad hoc. And that shows you that because that's the way in which the common law developed originally, 
That's the way in which the common law can develop today. That's the way in which law can develop today. It can develop in that pragmatic way. And the message um, is that there was not one development, not one event, not one day that resulted in vengeance being replaced by justice. The rise of the common law was a pragmatic consequence of the need to maintain order and developments were responses to the particular needs and particular tensions of those times. And this fits in with what I argue in my recent book on subversive legal history, um, which was published by Routledge earlier this year. Because I say that if you look at history properly, if you look at how at legal history, if you look at how, how legal change occurred, then legal history is not irrelevant. It's not archaic. It's actually anarchic because it can be used to question what we think we know about the law, what we think we know about the common law. The story we've looked at today questions the account of the common law as being universal, as being objective, um, as being autonomous, as being planned, as being a story of linear progress. So using legal history subversively can reveal how the law and legal institutions are not fixed, but are constructed and are constructed by people to fit the needs of a particular time. It shows that every line drawn in the law and everything the law holds dear is arbitrary. And it also therefore shows that the environment in which law students and law scholars and practitioners are socialized into is a historical construct. Because we are socialized into this idea that the common law is autonomous, the common law is natural, the common law is objective, the common law is universal, the common law evolved over time from a barbarous age into an age of progress. Legal history questions that. Legal history shows you that that wasn't true and therefore shows you that, th that there's potential for greater change today um, than you might assume. Because a subversive approach using legal history can highlight, question, deconstruct and reconstruct the constructed and authored nature of the law, revealing that legal change on a larger scale is possible because there's nothing inevitable. There's nothing um, that is certain about the way in which law develops. It's not universal. It's not objective. It's not logical. It's not autonomous. It's shaped by people to fit the needs of particular situations. And that was true of the origins of the common law, as we've discussed today, and is true of the law today as well. Thank you very much. Apologies, I took slightly longer uh, than I intended. I will now stop sharing the screen and I'm happy to take any um, questions. Hello, yes. I, I think you're still on mute. Thank you so much, sir, for thought-provoking lecture. We have some questions from uh, students. Uh, one question is from uh, Ikta Dev from Brainwave University. Uh, so she wanted to know that uh, the influence of common law in present day while deciding matters related to personal law. Um, well, yeah, ab ab absolutely. I mean, you know, the the reason I, I, I picked this topic of all the topics to talk about in terms of legal history is that, you know, the English common law is probably England's greatest import around the world um, and, you know, has been used um, for ill um, around the world. And, and, and so, yes, um, there 
the common law will have had uh, a, a significant impact upon um, personal law in India in other um, jurisdictions. I'm afraid it's, that's not a topic in which I know um, a great deal. I'm, I'm sure there's people on this court who know much, much more about that than me. Um, but yes, it, that's a very, very good point. And it's a point which I think when we're telling the story of the common law, um, we need to be very, very much aware of. Um, and also it, 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 it goes way back, actually. Uh, it, it's not just um, talking about um, the ill use of the common law um, and, 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 and the way, the way in which the common law is used to exclude and to other. Um, you can see evidence of that right from the very beginning. So yeah, that, that's a really, really good point, but one which I can't um, answer in detail, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you so much, sir. So we have another question from Partha Sarthi. So Mr. Partha have asked multiple questions. And the first question is, how common law is different from civil law? Oh, right. Um, yes, well, there's various different definitions of what you mean by civil law. Um, but basically, um, the distinction I think we're applying uh, when we're talking about the common law, as I've talked about today, um, is civil law uh, is um, the law which is applied um, on, on the European continent um, originally and which relates to the law which is found in a book um, rather than, so a, a, there's a code of law whereas the common law is judge-made law but just to confuse matters further uh, the term civil law is also used in English law as a contrast with criminal law um, so it's used to describe every part of English law every part of the common law then um, which is not criminal so yeah the term civil law has various different meanings depending on context um, and again, there'll be people on this call um, who will know far, far more uh, about the civil law than I do. And, but again, what's really, really important and interesting is when you're telling the story of a common law, it's also the story of the interaction between the common law and the continental um, legal systems, uh, including, of course, the influence of canon law. Um, which is really key in the period we've been talking about today and has a legacy which is much, much more important than a lot of people assume. Okay, thank you so That's much. That's a very good question. <laughs> and second is, what are the disadvantages of common law? Um, well, I, I, all of these questions so far could be, could be lectures in their own right, okay? Um, so um, the disadvantages of the common law system is that it's, de it's developed in a very pragmatic way um, through precedent, through um, the work of judges, and that does mean that it can get bogged down by tradition. It can get bogged down in a particular trajectory. Uh, and you can forget that, um, to zoom out and look at the bigger picture, and you can forget that lesson of legal history which we were just talking about, which is that, you know, um, there are more options on the table than you might first um, think of. Because as Brian Simpson, the famous um, legal historian Brian Simpson once put it, um, the common law is like a game of chess and you're moving chess pieces on the table. Um, and the problem with that is sometimes actually um, it's worth thinking, is chess the game we want to be playing? Do we want to be playing a game at all? Um, and that's the problem with the common law is that it can develop uh, in a um, pragmatic way. And also it's, it's, it's responsive. That's the other problem um, with the common law is, is that you're, you're waiting for cases um, to come up. And you know, the big lesson from uh, SFC Milson, from Toby Milson, is that the common law um, develops from what lawyers do. And what lawyers do, he famously said, was it's all about getting today's client out of today's difficulty. And so if the case doesn't come out, you don't get legal change. And the legal change is accidental in the common law system. Although I should say, of course, you know, the other may, big story in terms of the history of English law um, is the development of statute law. Um, so, you know, today English law is, 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 is largely to be found in statute form. 
particularly in certain areas like criminal law, uh, for instance. Okay, sir. And third question is, does common law prevail today? Does common law what today, sorry? Does common law prevail today? Uh, yeah, uh, common law uh, continues to apply today uh, in England. Um, it's still a source of law. Um, it's seen as now being secondary um, to uh, statute law. The judges now say that their role is to um, to interpret the law rather than to make the law, although that's a bit of a legal fiction because when they're interpreting and, and applying the law, they're basically making the law. Um, and, and, and yeah, you know, the common law courts continue to be the major sort of check um, on in, 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 in constitutional terms. And, and, you know, um, and also there still remains numerous areas of law and numerous legal rules which are determined entirely by common law. Um, so the common law is still very much with us, um, is still very, very important. Um, we've been talking today really about the um, the birth of the common law. Um, and I would suggest that any suggestion about the death of the common law is overstated, but it is definitely uh, possibly not as much um, of a healthy um, young entity, um, um, but it once was, and then that's the case for all of us. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Uh, next, uh, uh, what was... Open Hello. Please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, mute yourself, please. What was Lex Mundi project, and what were the findings of, with regard to common law system? What was the what project? Sorry, I, I, I missed that. So Lex Lex Mundi. Um, I'm I'm afraid I I don't know anything about that. So I'm I'm, I'm going to but email me. And I I will find out off the top of my head. Oh. Um, uh, Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Actually, there were like 109 countries that took participate, uh, participate in uh, this Lex Mundi project, and oh, right. I think this project was related with uh, common law system. So their findings right. are really very interesting. Right, that's something which I I need to look up. Um, okay, and, and, and that's that's the great sort of benefits of of these kinds of events is that is that I learn um, as much if not more. Um, so okay. I, I, I'll make a note of that and, and, and look for that. Okay. Thanks for that question. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And next question is from one of our friends and faculty, Mr. Randhir Gautam. Reds and torts were part of the old British common law that has been totally replaced by representative democracy and the police state. Today, police live by the common law as ordained by the legislature, which as always, is totally dominated by the riches. Right, there, there, there's, there's quite a lot in that question. Did the question begin talking about tort law? Did I miss that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, that yes. uh, rates and tort. Right. Yeah, Hello, sir. Um, Hello. The, uh, yeah, you know, the, the history of tort law is that, you know, um, tort law developed. <laughs> Um, at common law through the writ of trespass, actually, that's how it sort of came in, and then really over time um, developed into a multiplicity of different common law torts, um, common law wrongs. Um, the question is absolutely yeah, right that. that a number of these are now also dealt with or dealt with predominantly um, by statute. Um, but um, again, this is an area where common law and statute law. Uh, interact um, and are um, both important um, and indeed in terms of um, the, um, what the the central tort of, of negligence um, the requirements of that are laid out um, at, at, at common law um, but the, the last part of that question in terms of um, the role of legislators and, and, and the role of the rich and 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 the um, interested absolutely that 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 that's a key um, point here as well in terms of who are the legislators uh, and that's something else which legal history can help to unpack because the sort of the simplified stories we tell of law 
be that common law, be that statute law, focus on the role of legal actors. They focus on the role um, of politicians, legislators, judges. Uh, and what legal history can do is, um, is to show the wider actors involved. It can show the, the people who were, and the views that were ignored um, and, and, and the views which were, and the routes which were not taken. So uh, again, a fascinating question. All these questions are, are, are lectures in their own right. <laughs> Okay, okay, thank you so much, sir. And uh, we are having time to stay. So I'm requesting all the uh, participants, you can drop your question and we'll try our best to reply you or uh, your email contact. And uh, now Dr. Malik will uh, read the vote of thanks, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, Hello. Can you ask a, one question, please? Uh, yes, you can ask only one question. Sir, thoda sa, uh, 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 company law read difficult. This is defined? Company law? Company law is totally different. Common law is somewhere different. You can drop your question. I will be more than happy to answer you. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Arun, sir. Uh, a very good evening to one and all uh, presents virtually. I, Dr. Asaf Ahmed Malik, Assistant Professor, School of Law, Raffles University. On behalf of entire Raffles family, would like to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all for your gracious presence here today. I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to our honorable guest, Professor Russell Sandberg, Cardiff University, UK, who graced us with his being presence, guidance, and accepting our request for webinar. Further, I give a really heartfelt thank to the Chief Pattern School of Law, Raffles University, Honorable Dr. Justice Meena V. Gomber for being the source of inspiration, motivation for us in organizing this webinar. I must say thank to the President, Raffles University, Dr. Divakar Goli. I extend my vote to thanks the active participant from different countries, audience, students, everybody who contribute to making this event materialized. Uh, yeah. I am very grateful to all deans, HODs, all faculty members, my colleagues, and my dear students at different schools of law, Raffles University. This event has opened a new vista for thought-provoking dialogue. Finally, thanks a lot once again to everyone, and I wish you all a happy time. Goodbye, stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. <laughs>